weekend, we're going to finalize a mitigation memo with them, uh, which we'd like to present to you all uh, at the next hearing in a couple weeks uh, with Cambridge Water. I think that'll be the the last step in this process with them. Um, and you know, today, along with myself, just wanted to thank you all for your patience. We've been able to uh, uh, really dig into this with Cambridge Water and DMP and get this right. So I think we're we're at the finish line. Hey. Okay, uh, Kira, it's my understanding you're looking for a continuance. Uh, I would look for that motion, um, but ahead of that, I would just see, make sure, you know, we'll, we'll hear from Kira when he has got everything in line, so I don't think we need to ask any questions tonight. Let's just let him address it all next time. Um, but is there a motion to, uh, Kira, you, you're looking for a continuance, correct? Yes, please, yep. Okay, is there anyone? Uh, no, I'll make motion? a motion to continue to the next meeting. Motion by Mr. Donovan, seconded by Mr. Dufermont. All those in favor say aye. 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 Chair, that would be the 16th aye. of March. 16th of March next day. Excellent. Yes, I will see you all then. Okay. Great. All right, Thanks. Then. Thanks, uh, everyone. Okay. Next item on the agenda, Jerry. Next item is a notice of intent, DEP file 3160814. This also was continued from 2-16-2023. Applicant is Kim Scott, City of Waltham, Recreational Department. Property location, 190 and 282 Tapella Road. Project description. Projects consist of memorial chipping range and disc golf area. Additional improvements include access road parking, retaining wall and drainage improvements. Um, anyone here representing the applicant? Uh, I see... Uh, Arson, Kim, yeah. Yes. Good evening, Arson Hambardzumian, Nestor Engineering. Also online is Kim Scott, City Waltham, Parks and Rec. Okay, I'm going to hand it back over to to Phil, uh, just uh, because he's chair. Thanks. Hi. Um, so at our last hearing, um, which uh, I know a lot of uh, people interested in the project missed uh, because there was another um, municipal meeting at the same time. Um, you had presented updated plans and I had asked for a little bit more time to review them. I was, um, so I can share my screen and take you through a couple of questions and comments I had, but I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to present first, uh, just for the commission or the public. I don't, please, please go ahead. Okay. So at our first hearing, we, and at the site visit, we had asked to, um, wherever possible to try to maintain at least a 50 foot buffer between the developed part of the property and the wetlands, knowing that uh, the commission has jurisdiction over hundred feet, but the 50 feet is a good compromise between zero and hundred and is also consistent with what the scientists from MACC recommend. Um, and you had mentioned at the last meeting that you had done that where possible, but some places it wasn't possible. So I was looking at the plans for that and I'll just share my screen. Um, <clears throat> okay, you can see my screen. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just looking at the areas where we had less than 50 feet and um, you know, we, we're kind of used to applicants telling us it's not possible to, you know, give enough of a buffer to the wetland. Uh, a lot of sites are a little bit more um, constrained than this, this being a few hundred acre site. I, I don't fully understand why we're being squeezed. So I'll, I want to ask you a few questions about that, not to try to step on your toes or be the designer here, but just make sure we understand the, the areas that are closer so we understand what, what they're serving and, and why they're where they need to be. Mm -hmm. um, this first area here where you're you know, about 25 to 30 feet away from the wetland, this is a stormwater structure um, along the dip in the road. The existing road kind of goes downhill pretty steadily, but I think you're changing the grades uh, and you're elevating the, the end of the road. So you're following existing grades down to a certain point and then it'll, there'll be a dip and you're making it go uphill. So this is kind of at the dip in the road. Um, Mm -hmm. The stormwater um, 
I think you had described it in the first meeting that would have some similarities to a wetland. And I was wondering if you could give us more information. I don't think we have any in what you've submitted about what you're going to plant there. I know some um, people just like to plant grass in bioretention areas and mow it. Other people like to plant shrubs. You know, another rec department has done some pretty beautiful um, bioretention areas at recent park renovations. It had a lot of native shrubs and seeded pretty heavily with, you know, now it's full of cattails and it really does is a lot more like a wetland. So I was wondering if you could tell us what you have in mind for this and if we can pin something down and either put it in a condition or you put it on paper so we know what we're agreeing to there. Sure. Um, the, the pocket wetland I was referring to was further down the page. This one is meant to be a rain garden. So um, I, our intent was to have a four bay followed to an infiltration area where we would um, plant native species, ones that like water um, that, that would intercept it and clean it and, and, and um, utilize the, the runoff and filter it. And in addition, we're thinking about putting signage and educational information so that people could come and, and see and read and learn about conservation and, and what um, efforts were made to clean the water and facilitate uh, treatment. So if I'm reading this correctly, if you can see my cursor, is this the yep, sediment the the bay, this first one? And then the bigger one downhill of that yes. is the... That would be the rain garden. Okay, so does the sediment four bay need to be just grass or something low growing so that you can clean it out? Once clean it, day? exactly. Okay, and then the stuff that you plant in the other one, that's the one that can be uh, a little bit wilder in terms of native shrubs and things? Correct. Okay. Um, do you, uh, one question for you, do you ever plant trees in areas like that? I don't usually see them on designs, but I've sometimes seen existing ones that become forested over time. Mm -hmm. For example, one in Waltham that's in my neighborhood is uh, Bishop's Forest. Their entrance driveway right on the left side of it is a big stormwater retention area that uh, who knows what it was originally, but now it's fully forested. Uh, but the trees that volunteered to come up are all invasive. So I guess one question is just, it's a planting question, but also a maintenance question. If it's, if it's possible to just plant native trees there with the shrubs, I like that. But if that's not the way the system is designed to work, I'm, I'm not going to try to force you to do that. But if it's going to be shrubs, so it can't be mowed, but if there's a reason it can't be trees, then I guess what's the maintenance that prevents it from being overgrown with the invasive trees over time, like the one I referred to at Bishop's Forest. So can you tell us more about the planting there and, and whether planting trees is compatible with the performance of a feature like this? We can plant trees on the bankings, uh, so slightly higher than um, above the invert that flows out. As you know, if the trees are in, in wet substratum, they tend to have shallow roots and they'll fall over or they'll die. Um, so we can put it on the higher side and then we can put shrubs and, and plants. We plan to place shrubs and plants on, on the on the wetter side, on the lower side to filter and absorb. Um, in terms of maintenance, typically they'll, the plants will grow and dominate the area, and so they prevent much of the invasives if maintained for the first couple of years to make sure they they take root and they, they kind of dominate where they're planted. Um, so I think we would propose to, for the, and I think it was a condition for the first couple of years to control the, the invasives. Um, once that's happened, there shouldn't really be too much uh, coming in. And as far as maintenance, there's really not a whole lot that goes there. It's just making sure the vegetation is there and maintaining the four bay to keep sand and other particles from flowing into it. Got it. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the explanation. So I, I understand this a lot better now and I'm comfortable with that. You know, the sediment four bay is what it needs to be and the rest of it will be you know, as dense native vegetation as it can be. Now we don't have a planting plan yet, but it, um, so what I propose is we would condition that, that he would provide a planting plan to us subsequently for approval. But that, you know, I think we're, where we're headed towards is hopefully approving this with conditions tonight um, so that you're um, out of our process, but uh, we have the right conditions to protect the, 
the wetland and make sure that we still have the right controls in place. Is, is that how you would see that going as well? Yes, happy to do that. Okay, great. And I guess what is similar jumping over to the other bioretention area or uh, whatever you call this stormwater structure, yeah. does this similar discussion apply to this one? Is one of these a sediment for bay and would the rest be planted? Exactly. And the rest is going to be planted with New England wetland mix. Um, that there is some specific plants required in the regulations that we plan on, on planting, but I'm happy to, to run that by you, by the commission, just as a similar condition, as you mentioned on the other sure. one. And just uh, the other thing I'm thinking about with my comment about the trees is that uh, you had agreed that you would taken account of the number of trees that are going to be cut down to build some of these structures, and then you would agree to doing uh, some restoration plantings proportional to that. And uh, but we don't yet know where those are going to go. But um, anywhere that uh, you think is acceptable uh, along, along the banks of these areas, uh, I would mm -hmm. definitely be in favor of uh, because these are the areas that are most critical to the ecosystem. And then other than that, along the left side of the plan in our buffer zone. Mm -hmm. So they, those are the things we look for in the planting plan. Um, so I guess the the one area is it, well, actually, while I'm on the on this part, sorry, my mouse is zooming around here. Um, there's a, this feature I highlighted yellow. Uh, yeah. What is that? Is that a fence? Is that an That's existing the fence? Or existing new fence? fence that we will remove. I left okay. it there to show that you know, up to that fence is fairly disturbed now and to show that we're staying on the other side of it and we'll remove and, you know, clean up and restore as much as possible. Okay, got it, understood. And then my other comment while I'm on this part is the, uh, what I highlighted in red, is that all a retaining wall? Yes. Okay, I didn't realize that when we were looking at it earlier. Um, yeah, we made it slightly longer to eliminate grading and keep more yep. of a buffer. Yeah. Um, so the, the retaining wall with the fence on top of it to stop people from falling off the retaining walls, that definitely, that'll be an area that I guess wildlife can't get through. Uh, but I guess the wildlife will have to go around the edges of this and, and knowing that you're pulling back some fences that are already there, I guess this is probably no worse in terms of uh, obstruction to wildlife movement. Um, I guess a, a couple of things for your consideration, not really wetlands related, but since I work for a structural engineering company and one of my colleagues is the top expert in forensic investigations of collapsed retaining walls, a couple, couple of things for your consideration is the structural engineers who design retaining walls always assume there's no groundwater behind it. And they put, um, in fact, they'll put drainage systems to make sure there's no groundwater behind it. And if there's ever a collapse and they find groundwater, they'll blame it on the groundwater. But this one here, where it kind of looks like the retaining wall is becoming the dam for the, um, that holds back the stormwater pond. Mm -hmm. uh, just make sure you review that with your structural engineer, make sure they know that's how it's being used. Um, if, if they, they're basically gonna have to build a solid wall, wall there. If they were to put in like, you know, drain pipes in the ground and crush stone, all the things that people normally do when they design a retaining wall, they would just be taking all that water that you're working so hard to infiltrate and they would be draining it back to the surface and it would be coming out the weep holes and dripping down the steep slope and eroding it. And that would not be consistent with how we understand you're intending this design to work. So I just wanted to see if we're on the same page there. And Absolutely, and we'll have uh, stamped structural drawings in the submittal process, and we could provide that to you for your review as well. Okay. Now that part of it is only about four feet tall, so it, it should be feasible for them to design that to resist the soil and the water pressure, but um, they just need to know that. And then the other one where it gets to about nine feet tall at this corner, I notice it's also um, the way they design those retaining walls, usually they're you know, keyed into the ground a little bit and the ground that they keyed into is, is what stops it from shifting or tipping over. But in this case, you're putting it right on the edge of a, a very steep existing man-made slope. So I don't know if you've got any initial feedback from a structural engineer of that being feasible. Um, again, not a wetlands issue, but um, if you were to come back and have to totally change the grading because later because a structural engineer tells you you can't do that, then you'd be back in our process again. I just want to 
I have been in contact with them. Um, the process will be to bury between one and two solid blocks underground and built up, and then they have keys inside them to hold it. Okay. And it'll have like the geotextile tails that go back into the fill. So that's really what stops it from this. This particular design we're proposing has um, large blocks on the bottom and it shrinks as you go further up. So the okay. bottom so it's blocks just really big blocks. six feet deep in the in back behind the wall, six feet. And then as they go up, they'll go down to four, three, two, and the, the top ones are, I believe, 18 inches. Okay. It's almost like a cantilever system system at that point. All right, thanks. Um, so my my only real comments where I, I guess I'm, I'm still hoping for a little more revision is on, on the left side here, a couple points. One is um, I wanted to confirm you're, um, you're gonna remove this existing fence that's right on the other side of the stream on Scythian property. We discussed that mm -hmm. in the field and I couldn't tell from the plans whether that was called out for removal, but I just want to confirm that's still what you've, you've agreed to. Yes. Okay. Um, and then at this corner here, I was wondering, would it be appropriate to have a gate for maintenance acts at this, at this corner? Because one of the requirements is that someone be able to walk around the outer perimeter outside the fences and pick up golf balls or other litter. But as I look at this, you know, between the retaining walls and then the the 75 foot netting, it's actually pretty hard to get around it unless you kind of repel down the retaining wall. Uh, do you anticipate having a gate for maintenance access? Yes, actually I thought I'd put it in, but I, I must have escaped me. Uh, we'd like to put a double six foot swing gate, so 12 foot opening. Great. Um, so my last comment is really just about the, the 100 foot buffer zone and how much of it we protect along this stream on the left side of the site. Uh, we, we asked for 50 as a compromise between zero and 100. Um, we you got 50 in some areas here, but not at this bottom corner and not at this wetland up here. Um, I, I do still feel like I'm being squeezed a little bit more than I'm comfortable with there. Uh, and one of the reasons for it is we know that, you know, even beyond the limits of grading and the fence, there's still going to have to be a 15 foot wide area beyond that that can't become forested. That'll be, you know, mowed uh, once in a while um, so that trees don't grow into that fence. So that like even in where we, even if we had 50 feet or where we have 50 feet, you really got to subtract 15 from that to where eventually it could be the start of the, the tree line. Um, so then where you're only giving us 25 feet, if I subtract 15 from that, I've only got a 10 foot, uh, you know, truly vegetated buffer. And, and that's not even the width of one normal sized tree. So I guess my, I'm, you know, not to micromanage the design, but I just, I know it's a big site and I'm seeing 15 different, um, T boxes and a parking lot for 45 cars. And I'm just wondering, is there... Can we zoom any in? Reason and we, we, is there any reason we can't just move that line another 25 feet to the right to just so we get a full 50 foot buffer from from this wetland and, and this wetland down here? Even if it meant having, say, I don't know, 12 T boxes instead of 15 or 30 parking spaces instead of 45 or, or moving the whole thing to the right or, or something, I just. I don't want to tell you what the design solution should be, but I, I would like to better protect the wetland there. And it just seems like you've got a big enough site. It just got to be a way that that would be feasible. Kim, Kim, would you like to, do you have an input on that? Any opinion? Are you opposed to us reducing it even further? Um, and I guess after the 100 foot buffer, we could cut back out, but it's really not, not functional. Um, for the shipping range, um, but, but what are your thoughts, Kim? If we could keep the design to the to the the spirit of what we're trying to get for, this was recommended um, for veterans as well as individuals with disabilities. So, um, and this would be the ideal location for that, as the other parcels of our property are have other amenities already pre-assigned to them. So if there's any compromise we can make, Phil, in your your thoughts, as well as keeping this amenity still to um, what it needs to be, that would be appreciated. 
Could Phil, would, would you be open to adding 15 feet more so that it's a 25 foot no touch at the pinch point, even with the 15 foot maintenance area? And then it's only maybe a 10 foot wide area and then it starts to expand and become more, more and more. So you're proposing uh, moving the fence line, uh, did you say 15 feet to the right from mm -hmm. what's shown on the current plans? Mm -hmm. I, I think- Yeah, I, I could live with that as a compromise. Um, yeah. Does that still give you all the T boxes that are currently proposed? You, you think you, it'll just the, the end one will be a little closer to the fence or- or you think, I, I you think so, it takes a little bit away from the functionality boxes. No, you know, most people don't hit a straight shot, it'll go at an angle. Um, so, you know, the ones towards that end, they'll probably just hit the net much sooner, but you know, it'll be people who come earlier will have a better choice of tee boxes and people at the end won't have them as good. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. If, if you're willing to do that, I, I appreciate it. Uh, but that's a, I think that's a fair compromise. Um, knowing that we'll have more than 50 feet in a lot of areas and a little less than 50 in some areas, but at least we'll, um, at least we'll be at 25, including the, um, the maintenance corridor behind the fence. So that'll give us, you know, at least, a, you know, one row of trees between the wetland and that corridor. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I've been doing too much talking here, but other commission members, um, what does everyone else think? Are, are we at a good place with this to just talk about um, what written conditions we want or do folks have other design comments? Uh, Mr. Dufermont, I'll stop sharing. Too. Uh, well, I'm looking at this plan and I'm looking at a lot of maintenance issues. And I know that's not part of our requirements, but part of it is in the wetlands. And who is going to do this maintenance, Kim? Direct department, the city of Waltham, or are you going to have a private contractor do it? There's a lot of work here. And I've seen other parts of the city, so I do have a curious, you know, mind of saying, who's going to do this? The city of Waltham would have maintenance rights for this property. Okay. <laughs> That makes me nervous. I hate to say that. Um, the idea of the fence, you're still going to leave the fence to the ground, or is that going to be six inches or four inches above so the animals can go under? We came up with specific locations to provide. Um, All right, so you're going you're gonna to have openings. Can you do the same on the wall? Can you do something where animals will be able to go up the wall? instead of just running into a wall and realizing they can't go anywhere else and they either have to go left or right, which sometimes that's difficult even for people, never mind animals. So I'm just curious, is there anything we can do to make that a little more accessible for animals? I, so the wall is open on one side and I'd be nervous to put openings in the fence just above the walls, you know, kids or somebody could fall through. I think a the biggest opening would be four inches. Anything four, uh, four or above, um, I think, is is entanglement and and, and really not allowed. As far well, as I don't I don't want anything larger where kids could crawl through and get into trouble. I want a place on each area where animals can crawl through and have a little freedom, which they seem to have right now in that area. Okay, so think about it. The other yeah. question I have, where is this location next to the open pond and the field that was going to be opened up for picnickers and so forth for families to come there? I, I'm kind of lost where we are. Is the pond an open stream to the left of this development? To the pond, do you mean that the daylight program? That the, the engineering daylight program? program that we opened up the daylight, we daylighted a pond, we have a stream, and it's, yeah. to, is this area go into that if there's a fence there is that going to prohibit people from getting to that area is what i'm asking it's a completely different area of the site yeah it's a different area totally mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay this is at, at the malones where they took down those uh, other cottages at the bottom the of the other hill. cottages yeah. yeah okay so this is further over okay mm -hmm. and um 
you, you talked about maintenance fill of um, picking up golf balls and so forth. Is that also going to be by the city, the rec department, mm -hmm. to maintain that level? Are you going to have balls here for people to rent or yeah. use? Yeah. Okay, so the balls that would be rented would be picked up. You'll have high school kids or something out there running a machine to mm -hmm. pick, pick up and we can aim at them, okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, let me... Um, the, the next question I have is Phil mentioned something about a landscape plan and that we could approve this tonight without and making that part of a requirement. Um, I, I have a problem with that. I think the landscape plan should be presented to us before we approve this. But I'll let the other members decide that. Um, I, I feel that we should go in this with both eyes open and have everything done instead of asking for something that will come along later, maybe. So um, that would be my, my input, but I, I really feel that if you're gonna do a landscape plan, you're gonna do this, you walls and everything, we should be able to see where, where you're gonna put trees, where you're gonna put bushes and so forth. So that's it for me right now. Okay. Mr. Doyle, questions or comments? Um, I, I think we've gone, I think the design, the design will work. Uh, I think we've got some pretty good conditions pulled together that will help guide the design. Um, uh, Jerry, as far as like landscape plan, uh, stuff, yeah, I think it would be ideal to see that before, uh, before, you know, mainly present it rather before mainly so that the public can see it. Um, but I'm also comfortable, um, you know, getting it uh, as a condition of the approval. So we get it, we don't like it uh, or want some changes. We still have the opportunity to do it, um, you know, for, uh, for, you know, just to expedite things. I think that would be, that would be okay to condition, have a condition that we take a look at it before they, before they move forward. Um, my con, my big con is just, is big picture here. Uh, we've got, 200 some odd acres out here. As the city goes through the planning for this property, I, I think it would just make a lot of sense to draw a 100 foot buffer off of the wetlands and say, that's not developable land. It would eliminate this whole process, but it would also protect this big piece of, of open property. I understand there are areas on the site, on the 200 acres of the Fernald site that are already built upon and have buildings on them and such. And those places, yeah, okay, we can, you know, it's easier to build in those areas. And I understand that this area did have buildings on it at one point. Um, but I think when we got a, an open area like this that's up against wetlands, it just is a big picture planning idea. Let's just stay out of it if we've got plenty of other land to, to work with. Um, I guess it just feels kind of odd that we're we're jamming this uh, you know this use into this corner of the site. And again, big picture comment doesn't change the decisions tonight. Just wanted to throw that out there. That's all I have. Mr. Baker, questions, comments? Um, I'm gonna say not really. I think the questions that have come up are are good ones. I always have the questions with maintenance and uh, as long as we're doing a future landscape plan and it has uh, as one of its main parameters uh, biodiversity, then and I would give some leniency towards uh, the planting into the future. That's all. Mr. Donovan, questions, comments? Um, yeah, Phil, this this is advertised as not only the chipping range, but the disc golf area and the memorial area. Are we going to be talking about that before we put conditions together? I'm, 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 I mean, I'm fine with the chipping range as it stands now, but we're advertising the two other sections as well, both this time and last time. So, yeah, so just as a point of order on that, I think it, it did create a little confusion. So we received plans for all three of those program elements that are uh, apparently comprise the first phase of development. 
but the Memorial and flagpole area and the, the um, Frisbee golf area are both outside of our jurisdiction. So we will not be discussing them in our hearing. That's why we've been focusing all the time on the um, oh, that's driving right. range. That's so, right. um, so we don't we don't have as a commission we don't have any say in those other two areas. Okay, that's fine. Uh, then I'm all set. Okay, Mr. Andrews, questions or comments? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Spadoni, I, I don't recall if he's here. I'll see him. Oh yes, I'm, I see I'm you. here. Sorry, I've. Uh... Sorry, I, I, I'm not on video chat, I apologize. The only thing I would say is I was out at the site and Arson, I, I understand what you're trying to do to try to keep uh, as much area as possible, but we're also trying to preserve the wetland. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any opportunity that rather than keeping a straight fence line with that 75 foot fence, if you could pinch it in and pinch it out, you know, to, to, to work the buffer zone a little bit more. You know, if, if it's a chipping range, you want a wide area where the tee boxes are, but if you pinch it in a little bit to, to create a little bit more buffer area and then pinch it back out where we have a little bit more room down field, if you will, that may be an option. It may not be an option because I'm not somebody who designs golf fences, but it may be something to think about. It's just one of the things that I was thinking about as we were kind of looking at the design. Um, and we can talk about it offline afterwards, but just that, that was my only comment. So, you know, instead of widening out where we're giving more than 50 feet and going to the 50 feet, we were just trying to keep it straight and give you know, I understand we're giving only 40 at the pinch point, but we might be at this point giving 60, 70, whatever it is, and at some point 100, um, working our way out. So we're trying, we also want to, you know, compromise and, and make sure it, it's it's good for the environment. So I'm happy to work with you guys. That's all I um, So uh, this is a public, hearing. Um, we did hear from members of the public at the first two meetings, as well as um, at the site visit. Um, we received a lot of comments at the first uh, meeting. Second meeting, I think we only heard from one person who had previously spoken at the first meeting. So I want to ask from commission members if you would like to request more input from the public at this point in a third meeting, or if we've heard what we need to, and someone would like to make a motion to close the public hearing. I think we should give the public a little time, a few a couple of minutes each, and see what they have to say. Seeing they were all at another meeting last 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 time. Fair enough. Um, so we'll open up to the public. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand using the feature at the bottom of your little screen in Zoom. It might be listed under reactions. You can click on that and raise your hand, and you'll pop up then to the top of my screen. I'll call on you. We'll just ask everyone to be concise, and particularly if you've spoken before, um, you can rest assured that your comments have been considered. And it's not necessary to uh, repeat comments made by others, but so we're, we're particularly interested in any new information or anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak. Um, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Um, Paul Pavone, go ahead, sir. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. My, na my name is Paul Pavone, and I'm the business manager for the Labor's International Union, not the medical OA 681 Main Street in Waltham. And just a couple of points of information. I imagine this project is under the prevailing wage law, and the contractors are required to submit certified payroll. That's all I need to know. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone if that's else? to me, yes, it would be as far as public. Good luck. Thank you. I guess, um, so not hearing anyone else, but be before we close the public hearing, just um, in case the applicant has any um, comments on the conditions we're going to propose. So I did email out to my colleagues some proposed findings and conditions. I'll just briefly run through them here, and we can see if uh, there's comments on them. If not, we... We can try to incorporate them into the orders of conditions as appropriate. Um, first one is not a condition, but just a finding, a finding of fact. So describing that the fact that it is a, it's a big redevelopment um, 
and there's a lot going on on site and it's going to be over multiple phases and we have jurisdictional areas in various parts of the site but at this point you're just asking us to look at specifically the um, golf driving range and that we agree with the with how you've mapped the wetland resource areas in this part of the site but that as you proceed with work in other parts of the site you will have to map other resource areas and and when you're working in other jurisdiction area, areas you'll you'll be back uh, with a notice of intent for other phases that's the first one's a finding second one is a condition that we've talked about um, i think at the first hearing um, about mipa um, so MEPA is a, a state um, transparency and environmental impact report process for large projects. Uh, the commission does not administer that, but we do have a standard condition that projects we permit have to comply with all applicable laws. Um, so the proposed condition here would be just for you to contact the MEPA office and find out whether a MEPA filing is required, and if so, to comply with their requirements and, and and provide copies of that correspondence to the Conservation Commission. Um, the third um, condition has to do with the conservation restriction. We've discussed that a couple times, and I did receive um, correspondence from the mayor indicating that she's amenable and to and is is working on getting the conservation restriction in place. Um, so, you know, just to reiterate, that's a requirement based on how the property was purchased. Um, I think eight years ago has to have a conservation restriction in place and right now we're all kind of proceeding in good faith based on what we think conservation restrictions you say but before starting construction the conservation restriction needs to actually be in place and the project needs to be approved by the conservation restriction holder so that would be the the next condition um the the next condition after that is regard to the um the netting um, and just the, we received a comment from a member of the public bringing to our attention the fact that uh, birds sometimes do get caught in the netting. And we did see some good birds out in the jurisdictional areas during the site visit. And what we're asking for there is uh, prior to the start of construction, a uh, written inspection and rescue plan with input from the Waltham Police Department's animal control officer or another uh, reputable wildlife expert. Um, just a plan for if, if somebody uh, happens to see a, an osprey or an eagle or some other waterfowl or other bird caught in the netting, that they'll have a phone number there at the vending area to call, and the city will already have a plan in place with the uh, animal control officer for what they're going to do about that so that we won't have to kind of invent the plan on the spot while, while the animal's trapped there. Um, the, the next condition, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, rat poison. Um, I think the city doesn't use ten, uh, as much rat poison in the parks as it does in other properties, which I'm glad about. But this, this is a, uh, something that's been in the news a lot lately, and a lot of people in Waltham are passionate about. So anticoagulant rat poison is a well-documented frequent cause of death for hawks, owls, foxes, eagles, and other predators, including the bald eagle that died in Mount Fuchs Cemetery in 2021. And another bald eagle that hatched in Mount Fuchs Cemetery in 2016 and died two days ago um, from ingesting rats that had been killed by rat poison and then left lying around. The predator mortality caused by ingestion of poisoned rats reduces the ability of ecosystems to naturally control rodent populations. It also poses a threat to pets that may ingest poisoned rats. Older, more environmentally responsible and humane rodent control measures such as snap traps are still effective and are sometimes used by the city in sensitive areas such as parks and schools and newer eco-friendly technologies have also been developed. The city of Waltham's current practice is to place an undisclosed but large number of poison bait boxes throughout much of the city. During the February 6, 2023 public hearing of the Waltham City Council, Economic and Community Development Committee, the city official who oversees this program was very transparent about that, but was but dismissed the idea that uh, anticoagulant poison causes significant predator mortality when ingested up the food chain. And he indicated an intention to continue using this method because it's cheaper to refill the poison once every three weeks and leave the poison carcasses lying wherever they happen to die than to reset snap traps weekly and properly dispose of the carcasses. 
Um, so therefore, there's a reasonable likelihood that as increased municipal use of this property and the displacement of wildlife affected by the associated development could result in rodent sightings by people complaining to the city. In response, more poison bait boxes being placed by the city, leading to more wildlife mortality. So that's why this is relevant to me. Um, so I would like to propose a condition, and I'll also propose to my colleagues that we make this a standard condition on all our projects moving forward, because this applies to commercial properties as well. It's not, you know, targeting the city specifically, but the condition would say this: in perpetuity, no anticoagulant or other poison shall be used for animal control in in any jurisdictional area on the property. If the applicant uses these methods for animal control elsewhere on the property. Uh, knowing that um, sometimes people have a hard time keeping track of the boundaries between jurisdictional areas and not, we'd ask the applicant to track and annually submit to the commission documentation of the quantity and locations of all poison bait boxes used on the property, the number and locations of dead predators found, and the findings of state wildlife officials regarding the causes of death so that the commission has the opportunity to review and confirm they're located outside its jurisdictional areas. Um, so that's a condition we have not talked about previously in these meetings, but I wanted to, I guess, ask the applicant, uh, my understanding is you, they, they, they try to avoid using the poison bait boxes in parks anyway, because people don't want to find dead rats in parks. So I wanted to see if that's a, a condition that you think is reasonable that we could uh, vote on and, and allow us to move forward with the project tonight and, you know, alleviate any concern about, uh, poisoning of, of uh, animals in our jurisdictional area. I don't have a problem with it. I think I, I will defer to Kim for her input, but I know most municipalities in construction require baiting because it during construction, I guess, you know, but usually in urban areas, it tends to get the rat population out and, and about, but I think that's likely not going to be a problem here. So I mean, I, I don't have an issue. And again, the the um, health department official who was speaking, testifying about this to the city council committee, he was he was pretty clear that both methods work, and that the the main difference is so the the, the snap traps also use bait, um, but it's it's just a dollars and cents issue of how frequently someone has to change the traps. Um, so. If it becomes necessary, um, again, we don't have jurisdiction on more than 100 feet away, but we'd ask to be kept informed. Um, and within our jurisdictional areas, if it becomes necessary, it would be only snap traps or other methods that don't involve uh, poison rats uh, kind of wandering around, uh, dying wherever. Okay, with me, Kim, would you, do you, would you like to say anything on that or are you all set? You're muted, Kim. I think I'm all set at this time, as long as we can control um, any disturbance to the ground to Bentley, as well as the Girl Scout property, which would be my concern. Um, so I'm sorry, could you clarify that, Kim? I didn't quite understand that. Well, any disturbance, if there are rats on the property, would shift to more populated areas. So my only concern is if we're shifting to this new method, um, I don't know the disturbance or what will be seen at Bentley or the other or the Girl Scout property. But I'm okay with trying this new method. Well, um, I, I, we're asking you not to use poison. Is that clear? Yep. Okay, that's what we were asking you. So use traps. We don't care how many rats you catch. And if you catch rats and they're not poison, give them to the eagles. They'll enjoy them. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Hang them on the fence. <laughs> um, so next item we have discussed, um, I think this may have been somewhat in an email exchange with myself and the applicant, but just, just to confirm. So we've asked you to quantify vegetation impacts in the jurisdictional area, the proposed number of trees to be cut down, um, and I think, I don't think you've told us that number, but you did show them on the plan. But the important thing is that uh, we're asking for replacement trees. So any trees that you're able to identify as invasive, we only require a, a one for one replacement native trees. Mm -hmm. Any trees that are native, we require a three for one replacement 
I know we discussed that, but just stating it for um, for the conditions uh, since we don't yet have the planting plan. So we'll be asking for a biodiverse planting plan with a proportional number of shrubs and native ground cover plantings or, or seed, uh, native uh, seed mix. And um, the further rest restoration plantings to be located in our jurisdictional area, not in some other area of the site. And to submit a planting plan for approval by the commission uh, documenting compliance with this condition. Um, mm -hmm. So that one, I, I think we've talked about at length. Uh, next condition proposed um, is to revise the design so that the fence and golf netting is located a minimum, I had said 50 feet, but we'll make it, I think, 40 feet based on what we discussed. So you'd be where you're 25, you're moving it 15 feet farther. So that'll get you to 40 away from the resource area. Um, and the, the last condition is uh, just uh, clarifying that we're going to remove the those couple of existing fences that are still shown on the plans. I know we talked about it, but I didn't see mm -hmm. something on the demo plan specifically pointing to that one saying, remove this. Yeah, um, and can, can you confirm that we're in agreement, we'll put a six foot, six foot fence at the bottom of the netting and get rid of that those fences? Yes, yep. Very good. Um, I had one other thought that I neglected to mention earlier. Um, this would be, you know, subject to agreement by the abutter, and I don't know if they would agree to it. But if I can share my screen, I just uh, wanted to mention one other thing. So where I highlighted in pink or magenta here, um, there's another fence there. So there's like three or four rows of fencing between the site and the pond, and you're taking care of most of them. But this one here is actually the property line or it's close to it, but a lot of it looks like it's on our side of the line. I'm not sure if that's our fence or the Girl Scouts fence, um, but we're, put, we've, we're putting so much thought into the ability of wildlife to get through here. But that existing fence on the near the property line is actually the worst one because it's closest to the pond. Um, so I was wondering if you'd, you'd be willing to ask the abutter if, if they would be amenable to uh, creating periodic six inch gaps under it um, so that uh, wildlife could actually get out from the pond up to the other areas we've been talking about and vice versa. Um, it's something we, we haven't talked about yet, so I, I don't want you to feel like I'm, I'm springing it on you. It's, it, it's a request uh, that would make it better, uh, not necessarily a requirement of this project because you weren't otherwise working down there, but um, if it's something that's possible to do while well, you have a contractor doing a big project here to go along and, and buzz off the bottom six inches of a couple of spots of that fence, if, if the uh, if there's an area where it's clearly on our property or if the abutter agrees to it, um, I think that would be doing a huge favor for the ecosystem. And I think we'd all feel good about that. Um, so, um, I, I had I put that on my list of potential conditions, but as I'm thinking about it now, I think it would be too much to, to condition that because it's not really related to what you're doing, but think of it more as a request for your consideration if you're willing to talk to the abutter. I think that would be a great thing to do because we have so many abandoned fences back in the woods and um, where there needs to be a fence on the property line, uh, that's one thing, but um, if there can be a gap under the fence once in a while, then the wildlife can get to where they need to go. Happy to discuss it with, with Kim and, and the Girl Scouts, I think. That's the thing. A any concern about the opening? If anyone wants to, I mean, I, I don't, I doubt someone would crawl under, but you know, any concerns about kids in the pond? Or yeah, I mean, you could, I, I suppose, so for, so four inches is a smaller dimension that, you know, in, is in the building code where even railings and things that prevent you from falling off a high height mm -hmm. can have a four inch gap, but they can't have bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and I think that may be in some of the guidelines around pools is a four inch gap. So yes. yeah, if, if, let, let's say that that if if you're if you're willing and the Girl Scouts are willing to have some gaps under there, four inches would be fine. So that would eliminate any possibility of it being a safety mm -hmm. concern of someone crawling under and getting into the pond. But it would still let some of the smaller wildlife and turtles and things like that underneath. 
So very good. I think that's for for your consideration if if it if it turns out to be possible, but not a not a requirement. Um, so that's all I had, I, and I really want to thank you. I know this has been three meetings. Uh, we've gotten a lot of public input. You've gotten a lot of input from me and other commission members, but I really think the the process is the project has benefited from this process and. We now have a, a project that you know adds a nice recreational feature, as well as um, you know doing a, a, a better job uh, protecting, uh, you know, leaving a good buffer zone between the wetland and the recreational facility, and you're you're eliminating a bunch of fences and you're treating stormwater and you're doing a lot of things. So I, I, I feel good about voting in favor of this project with these conditions stated. Thank you very much, me, Phil. Mr. Dufermont. Um, on the uh, landscape, should we be putting a limit or a time thing when we would want to see this while the project is either starting or before it starts so that we can actually see a, a finished product to the us? Yeah, we, did, we did the same for the high school. We saw a landscape um, sketching over the wetlands before they started. So is there somewhere we can request that this be done within a reasonable time? Yeah, I think the, the so that the planting plan needs to be submitted before and approved before construction starts. Um, that's, I think that's pretty clear. So yeah, I mean, we, to your point, Mr. Dufermont, I always prefer that we get all the information together at the time we vote, including the planting plan. Right. But here where there's been a bunch of evolutions to the design through a permitting process, it would have been a lot of rework for them to re keep redesigning the landscape plan every time. So in this case, knowing that it's going to be subject to our approval and they won't be able to proceed until they get our approval on the planting plan, but at least in the meantime, they'll have this permit in hand with that condition. I'm, I trust us to be reasonable in our review of that. Um, and I trust the, you know, we, we, I trust the applicant to submit a reasonable planting plan, but if, if they don't, we, we won't approve it and, and we'll work together to, to fix it. So I, I'm comfortable okay. with that. But to answer your question, that would be required, bef not a particular date to it, but it'd be required before construction starts. And, and that's how we you know, have some leverage, if you want to call it that, to make sure it okay. gets done. Thank you. So with that, could I ask for a motion to close the public hearing? I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. I'll second. second. Motion from Mr. Donovan, seconded by Mr. Dufermont. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, opposed I think nay. Brad, I think Brad's got a question. Oh. Yeah, well, my question is, did we decide on the height of the golf ball netting? I know there was discussion on that. The applicant decided on it, and it is 75 feet in the plans. Um, okay. Very good. Um, so if there's no other questions or comments from commission members, could I have a motion to issue a, an order of conditions with the, our standard plus the uh, conditions stated? So moved. I'll second it. Motion by Mr. Doyle, second by Mr. Donovan. Uh, discussion on the motion. Um, one thing I wanted to clear, I don't think I stated earlier, but one clarification on the conditions. I think it's based on all the discussion we've had, but we have a standard condition saying that they have to leave a continuous gap under the fences everywhere. And based on the discussion at this meeting, we'll be amending that standard condition in case it wasn't clear. We'll be amending that to state that they'll provide the gaps in the spaces that we discussed with them and agreed upon um, in, with their new fencing. But um, in order to minimize the number of golf balls that end up in the, in the wetland, they do need it to be a, you know, a solid fence and netting for the needed will be changing that one standard condition to reflect the discussion at our meetings. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. The motion passes. Thank you so much, Arson and Kim. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good night. Thanks, Nate. Next item. And next one is a notice of intent, DEP file 316. 0789. This has been continued from 